Right, um, welcome back. The next paper submission of the Ministry for the Environment draft. Mr. Chief Executive and the Deputy Mayor. The meeting has started. Um, the papers on the submission to the Ministry of the Environment, the draft national adaptation plan, and here comes the word, manage retreat. Randy. Kia ora koutou. Thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, as I often do with my reports, I'm going to hand the floor over to Sophie to do an introduction. Oh, kia ora, Brandy, and yeah, thank you so much to yourself and the rest of the team for the enormous amount of work that's gone into producing uh, what is a very in-depth and comprehensive submission, making countless points and reiterating ones that we um, have made in the past. But I think it's a great it's a great summary of of where we're at, and also including um, our takutai kapiti process in there. I mentioned of that. Um, very well woven through um, in terms of our kind of current context. Um, with adaptation specifically on the coast. So for those of you who aren't aware, but you probably are through reading the report, uh, MFE are currently consulting on a draft national adaptation plan. And the purpose of this is to help Aotearoa minimise damage from the impacts of climate change uh, that are with us now, as we already know, and that will continue to be with us into the future. Um, so it inspires to help all sectors and communities prepare for change and also live with and thrive in a very different climate. Um, one which which we know is being um, is being caused by increasing emissions across Aotearoa and the world. Uh, it's the first step in a clear direction for how we'll adapt to the irreversible impacts of climate change and manage uncertainty that comes with it. So this is is a very important thing for us as as a council and as a community to be having our say on, um, because we know that we are increasingly experiencing the impact of climate change and this, our draft submission makes this very clear um, particularly in terms of more frequent and severe storm events but we also know that the impact on the impact of climate change on already naturally high groundwater tables through rising sea levels and increasing rainfall adds to those challenges so again i'd just like to say a big thanks to staff especially brandy um, for the incredible co incredibly comprehensive submission articulately and succinctly making many points, which I know we won't be the only ones making through this consultation. And if I can just kind of draw your attention to one really kind of key point that I think's made very well, and it's, it's, a, it's one that we need to be at the front of this discussion. Local councils, and this is a direct quote from the submission that Brandy's written, uh, local councils are on the front line when it comes to local communities and climate change adaptation. Without legislative reform to ensure that councils have the right tools and supports available, it will remain incredibly difficult to take the type of bold action required to help our communities adapt to changing climate. So we are asking for that support. We're asking for the tools and we are asking for, um, yeah, for more to be done to, to better enable councils to play uh, the role that we know we can play, um, but it needs to be, be with support from central government. So having this draft plan is a really good place to start, and I'm confident that the comments we've woven through our submission only look to enhance um, what the National Adaptation Plan is intending to achieve and how it seeks to do that. And again, the reference of Takutai Kapiti and the important role that that, the, that project and process plays in Kapiti's adaptation uh, story is really important. Uh, one comment I have made also to Brandy um, is it's important too that the kind of adaptation story doesn't stand alone and we talked this morning about um, the importance of investment in, in the extension uh, and capacity of, of commuter rail and so I've just requested that the cover letter um, be used too as an opportunity to emphasise our disappointment about the budget in relation to rail north of Waikanae um, to, to get that mentioned in there too um, but just to say that yeah I'm really really stoked with how much work's gone into this submission um, how seriously it's been taken and yeah how comprehensive I think we are making our point clear so thanks again to Brandy and yeah thanks again for the opportunity to speak briefly to the report. Thank you Councillor for Brandy. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for that, Sophie. I really appreciate it. There is one thing I realized um, that I do want to say. 
I've certainly helped to pull this together, but I'm not the only author. We have had so many people from across council work on this. It has been lovely. Angela in the back has provided feedback. We've had Chris Worth. We've had Steve Cody in building. Um, I could go on and on with infrastructure and Ninka and Sean. So it was a collective effort. So I certainly don't want to take credit for writing all of it. Uh, I do agree that at times it is repetitive, but we have attended MFE held, had two webinars uh, for local government specifically about the draft NAP and coastal adaptation. And they made it very clear to us that different parts of the, cause there's, you know, what is it, 70 some odd questions will go to different teams to um, analyze the feedback. So we actually felt that sometimes it's important to reiterate things because we weren't sure how widespread the different responses would be circulated. So that's part of the reason why we appreciate that it is a little bit repetitive, and I think that's okay. I did also want to say that yesterday we met briefly with the Takatai Kapiti panel. They were interested in this. Um, Mayor Guru and, and Janet were both there, so they might be able to provide more. Oh yeah, and Sophie, of course. Sophie was there online. Um, I thought they might have more to add. They were comfortable with our approach that if you noticed in the parts about managed retreat, we were very careful because we certainly don't want to say anything that would jeopardize that process. So, um, yeah. With that, do you have any further questions or comments? Right. Um, can I start um, on page four of the submission? Um, you talk about, and, and Sophie touched on this also, need for the sort of legal uh, changes to help local authorities. I particularly refer to Section 44 of the Local Government Act, which requires us to put any hazard information on limbs. We know that it was tested, and case law says that you can put the information, but the information must be accurate. So that brings a whole lot of debate on whether the information is accurate or not. So in the case of sea level rises and stuff, it's always been contested on evidence for that. Um, we found that out the last round uh, to the uh, discipline changes in 2012, 1912, uh, 2012. Um, some months ago, um, I got a call from the Associate Minister for the Environment the Honourable Kiri Allen, and she said that the staff are working towards a template whereby if local authorities follow these steps A, B, C, D, then they would be exempt from any legal challenges. Um, I don't see anything so far. At that point, it was imminent that it was coming. Have you had any other information in that area? Because I think this is where, and you mentioned in your report quite correctly, when it comes to the impact on property values, that becomes the subject of the whole discussion of climate change, um, anchored into the individual property values and aggregating them to become a political force to then challenge council's position. So we are caught. Um, have we had any move in this direction in terms of some help concrete help in this area. Chief Executive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brandy. Uh, I can, I guess, add to that in the um, DIA, Department of Internal Affairs, have been actually working on that element to it with regard to limbs and hazard information. And um, I have a meeting coming up on the 22nd of June to get an update from them on, um, on where they've got to in terms of that um, assistance and to the conversation is some of that has been around centralised uh, hazard information storage and um, I guess custodianship vesting somewhere else other than with council so there has been some work going on it's been going on for some time so hopefully we will hear something positive um, towards the end of June in terms of that process I don't know if Brandy has anything else other to add for you again, Mr. Mayor. The only other thing that I did want to add, and I'll come back, maybe Sean and I can discuss this before his meeting. 
In the supporting actions on the draft NAP, they talk about this project that DIA is working on to improve natural hazard information on LIM. And they talk about how changes to legal requirements will help people, et cetera. But the time frames for that are 2022 to 2026. And that 2026 could certainly be problematic. That seems too far out, even too far out for our own Takatai Kapiti project. But maybe Sean can, we can query that when he meets with them. So it's a question of speed because um, we are already engaging in a situation with the Jacobs report and stuff. Um, do you know how we're dealing with that? So at the moment we are, I guess, continuing with the approach that um, we adopted uh, based on previous legal advice um, and making the Jacobs report or reference to that report available through the LIM process. Okay. Um, the next question I've got is on the uh, concept of risk assessment. Um, I get it from here that the National Climate Change Risk Assessment that was developed includes economic, cultural, and social factors, um, whereas crew has questioned whether that's the actual uh, direction of the coastal statement, which goes for the technical sea life, sea level rise, and the risk from that angle. Um, are we in sync in this area um, in terms of risk assessment? Is, is you know, is this a cart before the horse, or the horse before the cart? I don't know. They seem to be, or is, are they just splitting hands on this? I might defer to Sean on this in part, but I will say from the National Climate Change Risk Assessment, they have provided guidance for local government on how to run risk assessments, but I think also there are two different types. There is risk assessment for an entire region or a district, which is one that, for example, NINCA is working on as part of the Wellington Regional Growth Framework. They doing, they're doing a, a regional climate change impact assessment for the entire region that looks at all these domains. And that is, though, I think slightly different than when you're doing specific risk assessments related to property on land that um, will get pulled into these larger district planning processes. So um, I did not stay at Takatai Kapiti yesterday when Jacob spoke to you about the risk, the whole approach for risk for that project, and maybe Sean can speak to that more. I don't know how much it aligns or doesn't align with this other national guidance, or if it actually needs to align because it's a slightly different purpose. Sorry, Mr. Chair, could you, the, the question? Yeah, that you were I, I think to? one of the questions that was raised by crew was the difference between a risk assessment and the vulnerability assessment, mm -hmm. which includes social, cultural, environmental factors. Whereas the other risk assessment is basically the impact of estimated sea level rise on properties. So the, to understand, I guess, the extent of risk, you need to understand all of those elements that are affected by the rate of sea level rise and, I guess, the, um, the potential physical impacts of erosion within a certain area. So unless you understand those elements, you can't effectively evaluate the risk in its entirety in terms of the, um, the effect, I guess, so the, the, the frequency effect and the effect as with regard to social, economic, um, environmental, is part of that process. So both mm -hmm. of those, so they're all, they're, they're embedded into each other. So the pro the I guess the program that you work for in terms of timing to, to do that work, what we're doing with the uh, Takatu Kapade work is to look at the vulnerability hazard elements to then factor those into a more detailed risk assessment where you will plug in those other elements. So you, you, does that? Um, yeah, yeah, it does, it does, it does. I suppose if there's a place where there are no houses, nobody, it's a sort of semi-desert, well, nobody cares what the risk is. But you may have a um, an ecological, um, environmental 
value associated with some of those areas. So again, you need to quantify that, understanding the geographical extent as to what that climate change, Mm. sea level rise uh, element may uh, actually impact on to come to a position with regard to overall risk. The the problem is, you know, is the litigation side. Unless the government has got definitions and policies that directs it, um, otherwise, like Jack Hodder, he said, um, the courts will be making policy by de facto. And that's the problem. Um, anyway, um, questions? Any, any other questions? Councillor Compton. Uh, through the Mayor, thank you. On page 7 of the submission and page 108 of Council papers, you've got that uh, comparison between government operating revenue and uh, Council uh, local government uh, revenue, and I was wondering if any consideration had been given to updating it to the latest figures which StatsNZ have on their website, because it, it paints an even more stark picture than what you've already got there. I think um, government revenue has increased, if I'm doing this off the top of my head very quickly, it's only like 14.7 billion just last year, so this year, last year was a slight dip. Um, now that's the total entire cost of climate change estimated back in 2019 to local authorities. Um, and then over the same period, our revenues increased only by, I think, $2 billion as a sector. So there's this, this huge and growing gap um, between government's ability to raise or collect revenue, because they have effectively a tax increase every year through bracket creep, um, and that's where the bulk of their additional funding's come from, whereas rate funding is sort of right down the bottom of the picking order. So I, I just wonder what consideration has been given to really just hammering home that this gap in revenue ability has uh, just been accelerating and it's not being addressed in any way. Through, through you, Mr Mayor, um, I was aware that I'd, I would love to update this. Because these figures had originally come, came, uh, this figure, from the submission that, the um, yeah, that yeah. Mark had, de Hast had written, I'd hoped that he might be able to help me to update it. But I know that he hadn't had time up to this meeting. So if that's something that these guys, I can update it on my own, but I want to make sure I don't introduce any errors. So if that's something, I know I'm putting you on the spot, Mark. Uh, and I know you're very busy because of the annual plan and here, or, you know. Yeah, executive. yeah I think if, if we can do that, and then we certainly will do it. So, um, but again, it'll come back to time and availability to do that. So I can certainly do it. I just would like someone to double check it. Council Coates. Uh, I've got a few questions, um, but that, um, if I could be really clear, I think that it's a, a really good submission. Uh, the fact that I've got a number of questions is, is not to detract from that. Um, will there be the opportunity to speak to the submission, and if so, are we? And would that include Councillor Hanford, for example? One, unfortunately, D, uh, MFE made it clear that they are unlikely to give us any opportunity to speak to this submission, uh, but we do say that we would love to speak to the submission. I've also learned as an aside through Takatai Kapiti yesterday that um, some of your Takatai Kapiti representatives have made a direct meeting with um, James Shaw to discuss it. Mm. Um, but um, if we had the opportunity to speak to it, I would love for Sophie, Guru, Sean to do that. Thank you. Um, The cover letter that you referred to um, in relation to mentioning the government decision around the uh, Greater Wellington train package, my concern about it just being in the cover letter is um, will it be seen by those who need to see it? And then if not, can we weave it somewhere into one of the responses through the submission? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. I could put it into the infrastructure section where we talk about... um, you know, they make reference to Waka Kotahi, and we actually say um, an NZ Rail climate change adaptation plan is, ret- is ret- required. Thanks, Brandon. We can put that in there too. Megra, I've got a few more, but they're quite quick ones just through there. Um, Go for it. Under number 16 within the report, Tangata Whenua, we have not engaged directly with Iwi. I appreciate with a number of these submissions, they have quite quick turnaround, and I think you referenced that in this one. Is that mainly the reason behind that? I know and others it's that you've reached out but haven't had a response? I've reached out through our iwi uh, relationship team and to make sure that our iwi partners were aware that it was happening and to let us know if they wanted 
me to engage with them to incorporate okay. their feedback, but I haven't heard anything. Thank you. Um, then further down, um, sorry, such a big one, um, submission, I've just got to scroll down. Um, page 119 of the Council Report, 18 of the submission. Um, so here, and then as you appreciate as an elected member, you read it, you think of questions, and then you get further through the submissions and you see that comes up again. So some of this can be related to other questions throughout, but I note your comment earlier around repetition, and I think that's a really good point that you, you made there. Um, but in particularly around iwi, I've got my note here is to involve them from the start, to make the point that you know, and some of the questioning, it, it almost infers that they could be asked, but not necessarily be asked at the start of anything. Um, then adequately resource and empower through participation and discussion and decisions. Um, the next one is, and again, that's sort of repeated on 23 of the submission. Um, around um, included an in infrastructure adaptation decision making and I thought there you could put you know at the start. Um, then on page 24 of the submission 125 of the report and sorry to be pedantic but it, it refers to um, the impacts of um, climate change and the landslip on Ōtaki Gorge it says it's unlikely that the full road will be repaired again and I think it's a bit premature to make that statement especially when that will be a council decision obviously led by a staff report but I mean for others picking up on this and reading that I think that's a, yeah, a little bit misleading Would it be fair to say um, it will be difficult for it to be repaired on council budget alone? Yeah look I, I'm confident that the no. team can come up with some wording around what would be more appropriate there um, I just think that, that to make the statement it's unlikely it's almost like that decision's been made I could, well, I could add, I mean, in terms of the financial impact of these types of events continuing to occur and the impact that has on the community, rather yeah. than any... It could be it's challenging. Around. It could be yeah. challenging to reinstate and financially you know, expensive. So again, I'm happy for the team to work on, on that. And just a couple more. Um, uh, I think this, my comment here could be repeated throughout in a number of other areas, and you actually do, I think, further down it does sort of raise this. Uh, it's a question there on page 30 of the submission, 131 of the report. Are there additional actions within the financial system that would help strengthen Māori climate resistance? Uh, my thing there in reading that, and again I hadn't read further down in the submission, is this would be a question better put to Māori. And I appreciate they're asking us and that's great, but I think in our response, as you have done further down in the submission on a number of these ones, is to make the point that they need to ask um, iwi or um, themselves. Um, and then I had mentioned there around marae and coastal environs, but then I do note further down, they raise that in a specific question or comment themselves. Um, but that is something that I think would be interesting to hear from Māori and also from the government in terms of that response around marae and coastal environs. Um, page 133 of the report, 32 of the submission, um, very quickly, it's just around noting Council's uh, increasing insurance costs and the significance behind those increasing costs. I wasn't sure how relevant that was, but again, just leave that with the team. I think when we're looking at it, it's important to note that those insurance costs are escalating astronomically and the impact that has on our finances. Um, and I think I'm done or almost done. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Brandy. Um, can, can I just add another question? Before I go on to Councillor Pravnov, yeah, um, birthing. It's a caesarean, this one. I'm, I'm looking at page 12 when you um, argument is the local government involvement is, is not robust enough. Have we looked at the, has, do you know that local government New Zealand has put in one? Which we can then figure out. I believe they will be, but I have not seen it yet, so I can follow up on that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bravno. Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Um, thank you, um, Brandy and your team, for providing a, a really um, um, thorough um, set of answers to this, these questions. Um, 
But saying that, I do have some questions. Um, so my first question actually um, um, is actually to Sean to a question, to an answer that he gave. So you was, you made the comment that um, when you're talking about the vulnerability report and a, and a, risk, assess it's, and a um, yeah, risk assessment report, um, you were saying that um, um, the risk assessment report um, is potentially coming. Um, yeah. But it's my understanding that Jacobs were commissioned to actually do a risk assessment in the first instance, but they produced a vulnerability report. Could you provide clarity on that, please? Uh, sorry, Mr Chair, I'm not sure the relevance of that particular question to the paper that relates to the... Do we have in front of us? The question that was asked before was re with regard to risk in the conversation mm. within the paper. Um, I'm happy to provide you an answer offline to that question, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Um, so, one of my other, um, I've got sort of three areas I wanted to talk about. So, one of the other areas that I've actually got a little bit of concern with. So, a number of places in this report it refers to, I suppose, the difficulty in dealing with community groups. Um, and I'm just wondering why that is actually mentioned on a number, number of occasions in this report when it's my understanding that Council have not um, engaged with them and also we have been instructed as councillors not to actually speak with them. Chief Executive. Sorry, through you, Mr Chair, could you, Council, could you reference exactly where it is in the report that you're referring to? Um, I think um, there's it's some a mention. It's a number of places in here. I, there's some mention about the concept of um, property, those uh, people responding based on property values. I know there's one. Yes, yeah, so, so I suppose it ties, I think it's in certain areas where it ties up, you know, with litigation. Um, when I'm, um, I'll ask another question and I'll, then I'll find specific examples. But my, my second question. Um, relates to um, one, 107 of the document. So in here, it, it talks about, um, I suppose, putting the onus on property owners to, um, I suppose, um, to adapt in whatever ways or make decisions about looking after their properties. But I suppose, uh, to me, it seems really important that KCDC actually puts um, plans in place or makes decisions that actually um, help property owners to do that. For example, you know, when you for example, when you're looking at median density, and there are a lot of coastal areas that potentially can be built on, which are going to be right in the thick of um, some of these climate adaption of climate changes issues, but um, there's, there's nothing saying that. So why is that? So I, um, Mr Chair, I don't know, Brandy, is that, so you're page 107. Yes. You're referencing the, yes. there's five bullet points there that talk no, it's about. Before that. It's, it's, in the, it's in the paragraph before that. Yeah, but one of those, bullet, the last bullet point, refers to regulatory requirements for buildings taking yeah. into account climate yeah. data? So there's, is, is that page that... there and also on, on, one, on 109 as well. Yeah, so it was more around the context of the question with regard to what's what's yeah, provided so in the response on that page and in, in those paragraphs. Yeah. Is that So I suppose it's a sufficient? case of saying that, um, you know, that, that, that property owners need to take responsibility, and which, which is fine, but I think also to when, when council has the opportunity to actually um, make those decisions ahead of people buying, buying properties, that actually isn't included in that. I'm sorry to ask this, but what is the council, what is the uh, question number? Because I'm not finding where you're referring to. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so basically you've got um, question number what page is it on? 
um, 108. Oh. On the con council agenda page. It's on my hard copy page. It's, it's um, page number seven of the actual submission. Yep. Actually, no, it's page number eight, but the question is actually on page number seven. And what, what's your question? So why is there nothing in this um, in, in the answers? And I think it covers a number of questions that, that actually um, says that KCDC is actually going to take a proactive approach to um, to look at the types of housing that can go in areas that are basically uh, going to be um, affected by climate change. I don't think that I was aware, and maybe I need to talk to another team that that work that that occurs. So I, I must not understand. I'm sorry. Is this in reference to plan change two that we uh, were talking about, where that whole area has been under uh, qualifying matter, for that to be resolved through, it's a holding pattern, it remains as it is, and it will be resolved um, tentatively when the Takutai uh, Kapri panel uh, comes out with its findings at the end yes. of their process. So I think, um, We've had conversations around this council table about how flooding, for example, are not considered in those qualifying act matters. Sorry, Mr Chair. I, I still am not sure of what specific question you're asking relevant to question four. Maybe if you could if you could put it in writing and send it through to okay, Brandy, then that. we can we can yep. look to respond okay. before we put the submission through. Okay, so then my other question relates to question. Um, what page is it on? It relates to question number thirteen. <clears throat> the comment is on page on, um, page one one um, six. Um, it talks, and I suppose this is, you know, I know this is relative detail, but in there it talks about Pikokariki residents in the seawall, but the the, the the point of that seawall is actually to protect council infrastructure. Um, it's not actually for the ben well, it should not be the, for the benefit of Paikokariki residents. And when you read that there, that, that doesn't come through. Next question. Yes, on uh, question number 16C. So here, um, this is identifying support um, New Zealanders' most vulnerable ecosystems and species in a changing climate. The answer that has been provided here is unsure, and I'm surprised at that because I think, you know, a lot of the work, particularly in the you know, the Waikanae Mountains to the Sea project is actually about protecting um, the environment and, you know, basically in the light of climate change. So some comments on that, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that actual question is, are there further actions than the ones they've already proposed in the document? And they've actually proposed a long list of actions that they mm -hmm. are already working on related to sea. And I'd be happy to email that to you. It's in the consultation document. So if you go up to where question 16 starts, are there any other are oh, there yes, other yes, actions yes. we should consider? They already list quite a few that they're carrying out. Yeah. So I suppose what I was thinking there is in terms of <clears throat> some of the work, you know, some of the models that are used, particularly the treaty house model uh, with iwi and and uh, community um, partnerships. They already have that included in okay. the consultation okay. document. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank that's very good, thank you. Right, Councillor McCann. I'll be very brief. Um, I just wanted to say congratulations, great document. Wanted to follow up on Councillor Compton's point about page 108 in that graph, and I think James also s supported it. Just um, in formatting, one of the things that I've noticed from time to time is that when we print everything off in black and white, mm -hmm. it can be very hard to see the differences between um, graphs. And as Councillor Compton pointed out to me, um, that it almost looks like the x-axis, but that's actually our income. 
<laughs> it would, and my suggestion just for formatting for all of these <laughs> things is you can have one lines and then two lines, you can actually see the difference, whereas if it's just a colour difference, often we can't see it. But great document. Looks like um, no other questions. Um, recommendations, Councillor Hanford. I understand you want to move this. <laughs> it comes up to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I have a seconder? Councillor Holiday. Right of intro, Councillor Hanford. Yeah, thank you. I don't feel like there's too much to add, really, but I thought the questions from councillors were great and some suggestions on some minor amendments we can make before submitting it. There was one other thing that I just asked um, if could be done before we submitted it, which was connecting in with the Connected Communities team about um, the question in there, which kind of talks to how the impacts of climate change will be felt differently across kind of our diverse community with you know young people and elderly and potentially our disabled community being um being kind of yeah having to bear the brunt of of some elements of adaptation through um yeah through through them having different experiences of of the world so um that was one thing that i thought we could probably strengthen our answer on was just um making sure and this was this was mentioned in terms of our iwi perspectives and voice too is just making sure that this is representative of yeah of, of the diversity of people who will be living with you know how carpety changes and moves into the future with us having to adapt to climate impact so um, yeah nothing really to, to add but thanks councillors for your questions and thank you again to Brandy and as Brandy mentioned the wider team um, and the yeah huge array of different expertise that have fed into yeah this submission being as I think it is. So, yeah, thank you. Right. I'm going to debate Councillor Compton. Um, thank you. Being the absolute stats nerd I can be at the time, I've already sent through links to the uh, the stats for government, central government and local government revenue if you want to pursue those for that. But I think this boils down to sort of a, there's a fundamental decision that central government has to make. And that's either they're going to take responsibility for this and they're going to use their balance sheet and their revenue and their legislative powers to actually address the adaptation changes that are needed um, in a warming climate, or they need to decide that they're going to give local government the legislative powers and the revenue raising abilities for us to be able to address it. They can't sort of keep plodding along in this middle ground where they expect us to do it but don't give us the tools and they don't take any responsibility for it themselves. So I think that's one thing that comes through I really strongly in this is that the government needs to decide who's taking responsibility for this. Um, if it's them, they've got all the tools through Parliament to do it, but if it's going to be local government, you know, for heaven's sakes, give us the ability to do this. That report that Local Government New Zealand put out in 2019 stating that there was $14 billion worth of local government infrastructure at risk from climate change, I think it was in the next 30 years. Government, central government's revenue increased by $14.7 billion last year. I mean, you know, there's just our, our revenue, I think, went from about uh, $10.8 billion to $11.5 billion as a sector. You know, there's just no way, unless government fundamentally rebalances the way that revenue is shared between central and local authorities in New Zealand, that we can do this. So that's the fundamental thing for me you know choose where the buck's going to stop and then give that group of people the the power and the revenue to, revenue to actually get on and do the job that needs to be done because this issue isn't going away we've seen this week in wellington damage from storm surges um, and it feels like it's every other week we're seeing damage from storm surges in wellington taking out the south coast we've seen it repeatedly here in carpety uh, this year with intense rain leading to flooding it's you know, you think back only maybe about five or six years ago, having one of those big one in 50 year flood events, it still felt like it was a one in 50 year event. Now it feels like it's a one in 15 or one in five year or one in five month event. It's just becoming more and more relentless. So like I've said on the trains, it just needs to, as my mother would say as well, they really need to get a rocket under themselves and get moving on this and make some decisions and get some action happening fast. They need to choo choo on this too. Council Holiday. <laughs> Through you, Mr Mayor. 
Um, yeah, look, completely uh, endorsing Councillor Compton. She makes some very, very strong points, and um, they're ones that we need answers to. Um, I um, just wanted to comment on um, how such a comprehensive and um, very uh, in-depth report's been done in a very short period of time, considering everything and all the other pressures that staff are under. So thank you very much. And it was very um, comforting to hear um, how there was a collected effort and, um, and a lot of work across departments, which is really encouraging to hear um, with regards to things. But I also want to um, thank um, our young councillor, Sophie Hanford, uh, with regards to uh, her contributions in this space. I think we're very fortunate in this council table to have a very articulate, high energy and well-informed um, a person that um, is really taking this conversation uh, both to uh, a local body but also a national level uh, on, and representing not just our, our council but the, the wider community uh, in this space. I think we're very, very fortunate to have her um, at the council table and I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and I um, will certainly be supporting this and um, yes, choo chewing on to um, actually get uh, some uh, defined answers in the space from central government so that we're not just. Um, just flapping around, trying to figure out things ourselves. There needs to be some, some solid direction here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Thank you, through you, Mr Mayor. I just want to take echo the, the words of uh, my fellow councillors, uh, the support for the staff on this document and for Sophie and, and her demonstrated leadership. And also, <coughs> Gwen's comments about the government's got to make up its mind which horse it backs. Either it does the job itself or it gives us the tools. But the way of politics is that you <laughs> sometimes say these things and do neither. Um, so again, we have to make sure that the concerted effort to remind them they can't have it both ways. And that's governments of all hues and colours have played the same game. So there just has to be a change. And when it is the, the future of the planet at stake, maybe that's important enough to do things in a new way. Gone to Harbour. Thank you, Brandy and the team. This is an excellent and in-depth submission, so that's why I have no comments about it. I thought it's just so much work's gone into it already, and I just really appreciate it. And I think yesterday the lack of comments potentially from the Takutai Kapiti team were a, a testament to the confidence and the support they have with the submission, and I think we're very fortunate to have that group of people as well working in this adaptation space. It was um, really great to hear the progress that the team have made around that too, and certainly the staff support for that group is outstanding as well. So I just wanted to mention that while we're kind of kind of talking about adaptation, I was also going to bring up the um, the the fourteen billion dollar um, at risk infrastructure report that came out um, some years ago. Now um, I was on the national policy advisory group when that came through, and. Finally, we have some movement from the government. So I'm actually relieved that it's begun, you know, this responsibility taking. I don't know that we need to choose which horse to back. I think there, there needs to be a shared responsibility from the private sector, local government, and central government around this. But certainly some very strong and valid points made by Councillor Compton around the disparity between central government's ability to pay and local government's ability through the current funding mechanisms. And uh, this doesn't need to be part of the submission necessarily, but potentially this is a way that we can start looking again at the funding mechanisms for local government in general, not just in the climate space. Because we all know that the rates funding mechanism particularly in areas like ours where we rely predominantly on residential rates, that funding mechanism is just broken. We can't continue to operate the way we've been operating with decisions being politicised around affordability and a, a basic inability to pay for even not at-risk infrastructure, much less at-risk infrastructure as well. So um, I think this um, these proposed pieces of legislation are a good start, but certainly, as C Councillor Compton said, a long way to go, and some excellent responses in terms of our position on all this. So well done to the team, and um, I wholeheartedly support the submission. Thank you. Looks like um, no other speakers. Right of reply, Councillor Hanford. No. Okay. Um, recommendations A and B moved by Councillor Hanford, seconded by Councillor Holiday. All those in favour say aye. Aye. 
again carry it thank you very much reports and recommendations is item number 10.5 reports and recommendations from standing committees and committee votes Fiona um, thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I will speak to um, and present item 10.5 on the agenda, reports and recommendations from standing committees and community boards. I'd ask that the report be taken as read um, and happy to answer any questions if there are any. So basically we're just receiving the reports, you know? Yes, there aren't any notion. recommendations in the period um, that the report covers. Councillor Coates? If there's no other questions, Council yeah, If there's Coates. no questions, I'm happy to move. Yep. Council Coates moved it, and Councillor Harborough seconded it. All those favour say aye. Carry it. Excuse me. We didn't have debate. I just wanted to make one comment, if I could, please. I've, it's already finished, but I will allow you to say if you've got any issue to raise. Appreciate that through you, Mr Chair. Look, I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to um, number 5, 5.1, the Rikarengi Domain Working Draft Reserve Management Plan. Um, I was fortunate enough to be there where that presentation was made. Absolutely fantastic piece of work and very, very interesting what's happening up there. And I just encourage everyone to perhaps look that up and have a bit of a read of it. Um, it's Rikirangi Domain Working Draft Reserve Management Plan. Very, very exciting stuff up there. And uh, with that advertising slot, um, we are on to item number 10.6. Thank you, Fiona. Electra Trust election. Um, kia ora, councillors. Kia ora, Mr Mayor. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, um, I'd like to talk to item 10.6, voting in the Electra Trust elections. And firstly, the report seeks council's decision on whether you'd like to exercise your right to vote in the elections. And if you do, it seeks a decision on who to vote for. Um, I will take the report as read and can take any questions. Councillor Holiday, first one off. Uh, three, Mr Chair. Um, thank you, Steffi. Um, my first question is, we've got the current trustees here at point six on page 144. Um, could I ask who's not standing or who's not going to be standing off that list, uh, if that's possible, because it just helps inform uh, potentially who um, we might support um, heading, into, heading into that as well. Um, I, uh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm under the, uh, the reason I asked that is I was just made aware that Councillor Halborough isn't going to be standing at the uh, at the elections. Um, so that's one person that's off there. Obviously, um, uh, Janet is a um, representative of our area. Um, so if there's some other people that were standing down from Paraparaumu as such, then I'd be more inclined to be looking at someone to replace them representing us at that. It would influence my decision making with regards to um, who I'd be looking to support. That is a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer, the answer to that because that was not in the pack that they put out. So I would have to take that away um, unless Councillor Holborough may know that off the top of her head. Councillor Holborough. I believe that. Uh, as a matter of the trustee, people have to step down uh, yeah. uh, after, I think it's five years, or a certain period of years anyway. Because the trustee changed and it came every two years, this time there are two trustees who have to step down. That's how I understand it. Um, Sharon Crosby will be going for re-election, and John Yeaman will both be standing again. But well, how come his name is not on 17? As I said, I might be wrong. Yeah. Um, anybody have council quotes? Uh, yeah, look, I had a, I guess a question that sort of segues out of that, and I'm happy to be told I'm completely wrong. Um, but the recommendation, um, should the council decide that it has a part to play in terms of voting, um, has a space there for two. It says vote for and 
in the and so that's two positions. Yep. But the paper then refers to the, the turnover and the three placements. Is it three or is it two? It is three. Okay. That was um, we can add another space. Oh, that's fine. I just wasn't too sure whether I was no, reading it wrong, and, and um, Councillor Holbrook there mentioned two earlier as well. So there's several places where it refers to three. So I thought it was three. Yep. So, that, so the that particular um, recommendation has to be three, right? Yeah. And yes. So it should to... state that council vote for dot 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 and dot 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 and dot dot. And I don't see any names of dot 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 here. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, any any other questions or clarifications? No. So how do you want to do this? For a start, Council Elliot. Thank you. I just wondered um, if there should be a recommendation there whether to vote or not. Yeah. True. Um, and. If so, I would like to move a, um, a recommendation, please, that Council not exercise our uh, ability to use our votes for the same reason as many other years and that Council has a significant pocket of votes when compared with the number of actual votes received in these elections, it is um, considerably... Uh, has, has considerable, I believe, too much influence for us to be making this decision. Uh, previously, that's been, that view has been contested, um, and I think Martin Council Holiday has raised the point of being having parochial interest in this, not just for Parabaramu, but perhaps for Kapiti in terms of seeing that. So there is that counter argument. But having said that, um, there's always been cases where there have been a number of councillors around the table who put their hands up and it becomes a bit difficult. So, yeah, anyway, I'm at your mercy. Councillor... Thank you. Um, Councillor Elliot wants to move that we don't exercise our right to vote. All right? Have you got a seconder for that? Not at this point. I'll be asking the table. Councillor Randall would like to speak or second. Councillor Randall, do you want to speak? Oh, you're seconding it. Yeah, I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, that's good that uh, that we uh, that we don't exercise our vote. Um, and you've, uh, Councillor Idiot, you are quite happy. You your right of intro is already finished. It's or, correct. It's finished. Open for debate. Councillor McCann. With respect, uh, I, I don't agree with that motion. I think we need to make sure that the interests of our community are heard and our opportunity to have them heard is to ensure that there are representatives from our community. And I know that um, even though some people have read their reports last night, um, we've all been reading them and that is something that often doesn't happen in the general public and uh, I'm sure that they would be expecting us to use... Uh, the knowledge that we have to um, ensure that our community has a say. So I won't be supporting that motion. Councillor Compton. Yeah, I'd like to echo Councillor McCann's motion, uh, his comments there, um, especially because my understanding is that Horofunua District Council does exercise their right to vote. So we're sort of uh, tying one of our community's hands behind our backs if we don't step up to the plate as well. Um, though in saying that, uh, there is a candidate from the Horofenua who I think is quite well qualified and to be in the trust. So I just, yeah, I think that we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't vote on this. So I won't be supporting this motion. Anybody else? Councillor Holbrook. So I think as significant stakeholders, we have been given the right to vote for a reason because we are significant stakeholders. I just don't think that the people that will represent our community are necessarily people who live in our community. What we should be interested in mm. as stakeholders in Electra and major customers of Electra is that our community as owners of our Lions Network are looked after by the best possible trustees, no matter where they come from. And um, 
on this list, I can see people with considerable experience and expertise and also deep knowledge of the electricity sector. And I think that's what's important, not whether you live half an hour up the road or down the road. So um, some of these people are familiar to us and we will know whether they are going to represent our interests in a, in a, in a general way on that trust or not. So I don't think this should be an opportunity for parochialism, rather an opportunity for good judgment about who seems to be the best for the role in that space. So can I get this correct? That you are saying we should vote, but you qualify that. Well, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I'm voting against because the motion because yes, I think yes. we should vote, but I'm not saying that because we need somebody from Paraparumu or Waikanae, necessarily. Just okay. the people who are going to represent us as customers and stakeholders in Electra. Okay, so at the moment now, nobody else, so the motion is that we don't exercise our vote. That we move by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Rendell. All those who are in favour of that. My appeal um, is making yes, close sorry. statement. You've got a um, right of reply. Look, thank you. We've seen um, we've seen no votes, and we've seen some the last time of 2020 council voting. I think the one thing that is important is for us to remember that we represent the public, so we do need some sort of a mandate from the public in order to make this decision. Um, and secondly, if this is the way the council wants to vote um, uh, in future, I would suggest that staff uh, arrange for the candidates at least to come and present to council so that we have some idea of who they are and what they stand for and get the opportunity to meet them before giving the vote based on a piece of paper. Okay, thank you. Right. So the motion is for council not to exercise our right to vote on this election. And so those who are for that motion, can you say aye? I, I suppose council idiot, council yep. Those who are against that motion, say aye. Aye that motion is lost. So we're now um, in the position that we are going to vote. Um, we've got a problem now of who we are going to vote and for what reason. And uh, Councillor Elliot is right in the sense that we don't have a lot of information behind these candidates of exactly um, some of them say where they live, uh, some don't. Um, and I take the position, um, the point that Count um, Holbrook said that it's not the question of where you live, it's the quality of your service that you produce to this very large, um, powerful, if I can pun, entity. Um, so what method of voting do we want to go through this at the moment? Or there's no possibility of deferring this so that we can hear from them? No. No, unfortunately, there isn't, um, Your Worship, the because the timing. Um, yeah. It is in the report, and the voting closes uh, 12 noon on 10th of June. Right. So I, I suggest that I just go for, mention each name, and see how many hands go up for that, and then at the end, we can just tell you that. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to move, <laughs> if it's not inappropriate, but maybe it might be. What? I'm, I'm open for ideas yeah. as to how you want to manage this. So do I, do I go name of the name and see who, who pops up or what, what are the methods? I have to throw some names out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a good idea. So, um, like, for me, the name Brendan Duffy comes up because he's been, he's really good. Um, accessible to right across the district. Um, that's a name that I would support. Yeah, hold on. So that was maybe we adjourn for five or ten minutes and have a conversation. And yep. I think um, the chief executive has got a good idea. The uh, bird had whispered in his ear. Um, there's just an English expression, not gender wise. 
I'm just saying that uh, we'll take a 10 minutes um, break to have a discussion about this, which means that you can, somebody can move, we uh, um, take out standing orders. Move, taking out standing orders. Move, say aye, you will, you're seconding it. So second it. So all those in favor say aye. Aye. Right. Carry it. So we've got um, 10 minutes to discuss this. Well, I vote Sean. Sean's my proxy. <laughs> right. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll take it. Councillor McCann, your name has popped up first. Oh. Look, I, I, I wanted to agree with what Councillor Holbara had said about